Welcome to episode 93 of Warrior's Den. Today's guest is Sar Malkovich. He is the lead instructor and co-owner at X-Fighting in Sydney, Australia. He is originally from Israel, where he served in the IDF Air Force as an officer and was fortunate to become a Krav Maga instructor there, certified at Wingate. He eventually moved to Israel, uh, to Australia, sorry, and where he started teaching at a local school, and uh, this eventually led him to uh, running his own school. And we had a very good inf- conversation. Here's a little bit of that conversation. Self-defense deals with the onset of violence, it's the beginning of the violent moment, basically the engagement, the first punch thrown, etc. If you're amazing at self-defense, maybe you did your 360, maybe you nailed them with the punch, situation over. But in more often than not, that self-defense moment turns into a fight. So he defines self-defense and fighting as self-defense the kind of before to the beginning and fighting the during to maybe a little bit the after. Okay, hope you enjoyed that sneak peek. Sometimes when I reach out to people, I don't really know them. And if you're willing to have an open discussion with someone that you don't even know if you're going to agree with or not, you will have a wonderful time. And um, we talked mostly about uh, Krav Maga, self-defense, what that means. I did have some questions for him about what is going on in Australia uh, to get his perspective because it's always um, hard to know just watching the media. So we talked about that a little bit in our, in our thoughts. And it's always interesting to see that everyone around the world who's teaching Krav Maga uh, is starting to come to the same realization that we need to develop our fighting and combat skills uh, just as much as our self-defense skills because they're intertwined. Now, before I go to the SAR and the podcast, this podcast is brought to you by Urban Tactics Krav Maga, turning lambs into lions since 2013. If you want to train with us in person as a means to support us, you can check out urbantacticscam.com if you're in the Metro Vancouver area. And you can join our new student wait list at this time. If you want to just support us because you're online and like our content, you can check us out at utcamblog.com. That is where I put various ideas and thoughts on things related to self-defense or related topics or where my students or other people are welcome to share their thoughts on a variety of topics. There is something I've been trying to do, um, people sharing their personal experience uh, from self-defense situations, whether it be at work and security or law enforcement or as a civilian where you did some training, Krav Maga or otherwise, and you ended up using it or not in real world. We are accepting submissions of 500 words or more. You can send submissions to info at urbantacticscanada.com. And if we take your submission, you will get three months free on utcamu.com. We can, of course, publish those stories anonymously, but the goal of such things is to make people realize they are not alone in this world. And we will we want to make this blog to be more accessible to all parties uh, regarding so that they can discuss uh, uh, self-defense. You can also go to utkmblog.com on the support us and hit a donate link if you would like to simply donate and support the ability to continue providing this content, especially in these trying times where governments are making it exceptionally difficult to operate still in this industry. So online is always great. Now, if you want to see what we are doing and what I'm teaching, you can go to utkmu.com, as I mentioned. You can get a beginner or novice Uh, month or annual pass to see our curriculum. All it is for you is a supplement to your current Krav Maga training. Just as another perspective to see what I'm teaching, you can check out how I've ordered my curriculum. Currently, only the beginner and novice curriculum is available. As I keep saying, eventually that will get rectified. But again, as this global pandemic is screwing absolutely everything up, it is making difficult to get the content at this time. So that will come eventually. So you can check out utkmu.com. Again, no belt rankings. Don't ask me. You're not getting them online. That's ridiculous. You can just check out the curriculum and use it to supplement your current training. Or if you're just an instructor interested in learning how I've structured the curriculum, you can check it out there. 
You can, of course, do another super easy and free thing by going to Instagram, Urban Tactics Krav Maga, Twitter, Urban Tactics KM, or Facebook, Urban Tactics Krav Maga, and hit a follow, and you can always share our stuff, because we like that. That's more, the more word, the merrier. The goal, my goal is generally to unify Krav Maga and self-defense and get people discussing, though I know that's a very difficult thing to do. But you can support us by following us on the social media where I keep it pretty neutral because I need to. That's where the blog is for or the podcast. So I think that is it. If you want to check out Sara, uh, you can check him out mostly on Instagram, xfightingcrawmyguy.com. You can check him out there or you can check him out on his own one, Sara Kramaga. These are at... Uh, Instagram, so X Fighting Kramaga at Instagram and Sarah Kramaga, and he said, "Feel free to reach out to him. He loves having conversations via Instagram and is open to all discussions." Again, this podcast is mostly about uh, our, our Kramaga and martial arts and self-defense perspectives, teaching a little bit about what's going on uh, in Sydney, as well as we discuss our personal experiences to some degree with psychedelics and how they have helped us grow as men and become in touch with our ability to be more compassionate with other people though not at the expense of masculinity so check that this episode out with sar markovic krav maga is not just a self-defense system it is a way of life warriors den is a podcast for kravists fighters martial artists warriors politicians and general citizens consider this the society that separates scholars from its warriors will have its thinking done by cowards and its fighting done by fools. Lucididi, your host, Jonathan Fader, talks to guests in an open and uncensored format about their fights, their philosophies, and their lives. No topic is taboo, and the conversation may start in one place and end in another. As the quote suggests, you cannot separate the warrior from the politics and the world around them, as a true warrior must be a student in all forms of art and science. You're listening to The Warrior's Day. Warrior's Day. Brought to you by Urban Tactics Krav Maga. Turning lambs into lions. Hey, welcome back. I am here with uh, Sara Markovic, head instructor and co-owner of X Fighting in uh, Australia. How are you today? I'm good. How are you? How was lunch? Lunch was good. Lunch was good. I had to make it real quick. I got a bunch of phone calls, as I mentioned. Uh, people are panicking here, so <laughs> I had to deal with that. Um, but let's start with you. Um, How did you get into Krav Maga, martial arts, self-defense? And we'll go from there. Well... Happily. Well, I started with martial arts as a kid, like everyone. My parents put me in different programs from judo to karate and even um, I even did ninjutsu and tai chi, a, a combat variation of tai chi. Mm. Um, and then when I drafted at 18 is when I first uh, drafted to the Israeli army. 18 mm. was the first time I met Krav Maga in basic yeah. training and I fell in love with it. Finally, something resonated with me. It was practical, you know, aggressive, how I imagine martial arts should be in a way, mm. or self-defense should be. Yeah. And over the course of my service, I eventually was offered um, to become a Krav Maga instructor. So mm. I, I did the Krav Maga instructor course in uh, Bahad 8 in, um, and in the Army Division of Wingate Institute. Mm. Um, and yeah, and started teaching Krav Maga as well, while I was also an officer in the, in the Air Force. Mm. It was sort of a, a side job. Then when I finished my service, I uh, did a civilian instructor course, and I started uh, working with and at Impact Krav Maga in Israel. Mm. They are, in a way, the KMG branch in mm. Israel. Um, and then eventually I came here to Australia to teach Krav Maga here. This was six years ago. Yeah, well, that's awesome. Now, you mentioned the Air Force. Is that where you served the whole time in, in the IDF? Yeah, or? yeah, yeah. I, I was in the Air Force the whole time. Uh, for those 
for the listeners that don't know, so in Israel, you don't start as an officer. Uh, unlike, for example, in the US, you draft four officers uh, for the officer academy, right? You start there, um, as far as I know. In Israel, yeah. you start as a soldier, and then after about 10 months, you get the opportunity to um, go into officer's course, which is what I did. Nice. Were you like you weren't a pilot or anything? I guess just no, uh, no, no, no. Yeah. I was Air Force intelligence. Okay. Well, that's pretty pretty badass. I uh, I served in Givati uh, like ten years. Oh, really? ago. So, yeah. Really? Yeah. yeah. Is uh, how did that happen? So you well, moved to yeah. Israel as a lone soldier? Or? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm I'm Canadian. I'm in Vancouver or Metro Vancouver, Canada, and uh, is that a time in my life where I was like, I don't know what I want to do. Things aren't working out. And I, I could have actually joined multiple militaries. I could have joined the Canadian, the British, or the yeah. Israeli, because uh, I have citizenship. But at that time, the Canadian uh, military was already on its way out of Afghanistan. And I've heard the stories of what the Canadian peacetime military is like. And I, I didn't really want to do that. Uh, so I thought, hey, uh, let's go see what Israel's. I'd been to Israel before, and I'd thought about it. And I thought, let's go, let's go, let's go see what it's really about. You know, I went there, you know, with the dream of being special forces, but yeah, my Hebrew is terrible. Uh, I've forgotten it all already anyway. And uh, at the time I wasn't, I, I realized I'm not an, I'm not an athlete. Um, so they originally wanted me to go to, I, I wanted to get into uh, San Hanim originally, didn't get in. Then I said, okay, Galani. They're like, no, well, you should go to Nahal. And I was like, I don't want to be like everybody else. Can I go to Givati? And they're like, okay, fine. <laughs> so I ended up well, there. Yeah. You never know how your service will look anyway, right? It's, yeah. Some people have the time of their lives, you can say. It's, no one has the time of their lives in that, yeah. but some people really <laughs> gain a lot yeah. from the Nahal, from Givati. What yeah. I found is it, it doesn't matter in a way yeah. where you where you serve everyone gets a different journey a different experience that enriches them in a different way yeah yeah well i say i i did not have an enjoyable experience but i yeah. certainly i certainly learned a lot uh, exactly. what what humans are capable of you know what the idf is all about um yeah. and about myself as well so it's 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 one of those like you would maybe do it again, but because like you wouldn't be the same if you didn't. But also when yeah. you're like, ah, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. So uh, why did you decide to move to Australia other than the weather? <laughs> um, I was in a time of my life. I finished my army service after five years. I finished my university at the time and I was looking for an adventure. You know, in Israeli culture, it's like a thing. There's a, mm. this thing. You finish the army, you go for six months to travel around the world, usually South America or India. And I never had that because I was an officer. So mm. by the time I finished my army service, I already felt like the rush. I need to study university. All my friends are already in university and I'm not. And so I rushed into it. And then I still had in me this sense of adventure, this need to go explore, see something else. Yeah. Um, yeah, and then I got a, got a job offer to be the head instructor for a different organization here, mm. um, and I took it, and nice. it was quite a quite a quite a journey by itself. Yeah, and eventually I had to break out of that organization and start my own, which is where I'm at now. Yeah, it's interesting in Australia. Like I've never been. Uh, I, I've talked to several uh, instructors from uh, Australia, and uh, you mm -hmm. know, it seems like. Everyone, like in Canada almost, everyone just broke away from the main organizations. There was a few big names running out of uh, Australia and everyone just kind of did their own thing in the end, you know. Uh, is there a particular, re uh, other than the disorganization, let's just say, of many of the big organizations, is, was there a particular reason for that? Well, I'd say for me, first it was, uh, I had a lot of, it's, it's quite a story. I mm. don't want to go too much yeah, into it. but. Of it's it's a it's it's a heavy story for me it's a, yeah. you can say a dark part for me <laughs> and yeah. but a lot of it was also the fact that in a way a lot of big organizations find themselves having to structure what they teach and how they teach in a way that they believe fits the client mm. as a client right as a member 
while I wanted to teach what I always taught, how yeah. to turn people from the average Joe into a little bit more of a fighter, a little mm. bit of more of a protector, a little bit of better person that can deal with violent situations. Yeah. And those things didn't match, yeah. right? I believe sparring, physical sparring, facing adversity through, through violence is an inherent and important part in the mm. process of someone's growth. Well, for example, different organization would say that they'd rather not risk injury, risk having the students or the clients face too much of an adversity that might push them off staying yeah. members. Yeah. And yeah. No, I 100% agree with that. Uh, I find, you know, I, I, I interviewed uh, Ron Rotem a while ago. And he, mm -hmm. he said uh, Kramaga has gotten really good at self-defense, but not so great at fighting. And when a guy like yeah. him is saying that, it should, in, it should yeah. be a wake-up call to the greater Kramaga community. Because I, yeah. I watched your Instagram. That's how I, I found out about you. You kicked yeah. the crap out of your student. <laughs> uh, no, you have to. Yeah. You have to. First, yeah. first, that's what I was taught. And I, I'm also a big believer in... I'm a big believer in evolution of Krav Maga, mm. but I'm I'm not the big believer in me being the best out there to do mm. that. So yeah. I really try to keep what I teach to what I was taught. I believe mm. the people who invented Krav Maga, who developed it, from Emil Lichtenfeld to Eyal Yanilov to Zeev Cohen, mm. the, the, these people have dedicated their lives and have learned and have a lot of experience and what they taught me in the end is extremely valuable to me. so yeah. i tried to teach what i was taught and how i was taught instead of what we see quite a lot these days is people gaining the knowledge and then changing it again mm. and again and again yeah. i don't think i am the one that has the ability to change it i try to enrich it and fit it to my students and to the climate that i teach in Mm. But I definitely still try and keep what I was taught because I believe in it mm. as close. With, and I was taught hard, go hard, aggression. Yeah. You have to do that. You have to have people spar you. You have to, you have to be punched in the face. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I definitely agree. Like uh, I'm the only Kramaga school where I am that I know of that requires sparring as, as, a, as a requirement to progress. Now, I do have the face mask. I do MMA gloves and face masks. Just yeah. because uh, people don't like black guys, um, but oh, I found, 100%. yeah, by putting the face masks on it uh, and then going with MMA gloves, it, it forced people to have to like calm down, but they can still get hit in the face and kick back and and get over that fear of getting hit. And it's as a, a result of, experience. yeah, yeah, as a result of that, like when I compare my students to other places in North America specifically, uh, they I'm quite pleased with the results that you you have to do that 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 fear you know the fear of getting hit if you can't overcome that i don't think you can really learn self-defense properly um, yeah. i agree that's a big thing that uh, so my my business name is x fighting mm. um, and i actually i what i love is i really do see the growth in my students not as krav maga practitioners but as fighters mm. i see their ability to deal with whether it's boxing sparring kickboxing sparring mma sparring violent confrontation that we create in the in the gym you see their ability to do that um, and their development through the the time of their training to mm. be able to do that and it's amazing to me and yeah. i think the only thing that can do that is sparring is mm. is work that's a little bit outside of the technicality of the finger and, yeah. and that yeah. But actually, but by the way, I also think these days there's a little bit of a, um, there's a kind of a misconception that a lot of the Krav Maga world is not like that, mm. right? You hear that or some gyms work only technically and that. I actually think that the majority of the Krav Maga world is shifting or has been shifting for the past 10 years for understanding the value of combat sports as mm. part of our training for the understanding of value of uh, of uh, sparring and being a bit um, more resistive or resistant in training. 
Yeah. And that's it started, I think, in many ways in Israel, in, yeah. in the group I was training with, Impact Krav Maga. They yeah. started suddenly incorporating boxing, big, big elements of boxing and working with Nakash as well. Nakash and Itai Dannenberg and Ran Nakash, which were big into boxing and, and fighting. And this place in Israel kind of started this revolution of, hey, we have to involve hard work into the Krav Maga, hard sparring. Yeah. And it seeped into the whole world, I think. Yeah. I think. Yeah, it's funny. I never like I never know where stuff originates because I'll notice every few years that uh, I'll see an instructor or train with someone and they're like, Oh, here's the technique that I invented and then I all of a yeah. sudden see it I see it everywhere and I'm like, yeah. Well, everyone's copying each other. Everyone's um, copying. But like I was uh, I just did a Zoom seminar with uh, uh Amit Hemmelstein. I, I I'm very fairly close with him. Um, and he was saying the same thing because he teaches MMA, Sancho, wrestling, and Krav Maga. And he's like, you have to fight. If you don't learn to fight, that what, what's the point? And I, I you know, because I'm in Canada, North America, we're, we're a little softer here. And if I train like they do in Eastern Europe every single class, uh, people aren't going to come. So like I have, a, I have multiple classes where it's like, hey, here's the technical and talking and here's the kick the shit out of each other. Yeah. Uh, and if you only want to do the hard class once a week, I'm I'm cool with that. That's fine. But you just need to get it in there. Um, and I was, I was just trying to think about because explaining like fighting versus self defense is really difficult. And I was thinking the I, I, I pared it down to this that you must learn to fight if you want to learn self defense, but you don't have to learn self defense if you want to learn to fight. I think I think that's what I've settled on. Because like a ring fighter they just have to be proficient in the ring they don't care about uh the street but i think for self-defense you, you you need you need both uh especially with the rise of mma and jujitsu and judo well judo is kind of dying but of of the combo sports you never know what you're going to run into on the street or just a big yeah. big strong guy right so yeah. uh okay. I, I like well, i com I'll combine everything as well i my striking coach in Israel, Mickey Newman, who also used to work for him, but he's the one that started my boxing journey mm -hmm. and trained with him for a while. He said to me something and, and I think that resonated with me. Self-defense deals with the onset of violence, it's the beginning of the violent moment, mm -hmm. basically the engagement, the first punch thrown, etc. If you're amazing at self-defense, maybe you did your 360, maybe you nailed them with the punch, situation over. But in more often than not, that self-defense moment turns into a fight. Mm. So he defines self-defense and fighting as self-defense, the kind of before to the beginning and fighting the during to maybe a little bit the after. Um, and that's that's how I view it because Krav Maga is a lot about the initial reaction. Oh, someone's choking me! Release! Oh, knife out! Blow, etc. But then the follow-up from there, where we just overwhelm the opponent with striking, that's not how we know fighting happens so easily from our experience in fighting. Mm -hmm. And um, and that's I think where it ties it. Krav Maga takes the beginning and does it amazingly, like I believe no other martial art or self-defense system out there uh, based on natural instincts and efficient movement, etc. And then we have to take that self-defense moment, that reaction moment. And what happens if nothing goes as planned? What happened if my punch didn't land or landed and is not knocked out? Then we go into the fight. Then there's a wrestling component, the clinching component, striking in the inside. We have to move, maybe a takedown. Maybe we've been taken down. Now we have to do a ground fighting. Mm. Um, and in all of them, there's still little elements of Krav Maga happening because Krav Maga took a lot of its elements from wrestling, mm. boxing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I think that always resonated with me quite a lot, the understanding that Krav Maga is the beginning and then fighting is the continuation. Yeah. But um, self-defense is so much more than all of it, right? Self-defense yeah. is such a big thing. I hear a lot and lot people talk about self-defense as this martial art is better for self-defense. This martial art, self-defense is not about being able to throw a punch. Mm. Self-defense is first how you leave the house, your recognition of the situation, your ability to deal with violence, how you view 
uh, the environment, how you de-escalate, not how you use your words, verbalize yourself, how you position yourself in the world. Self, if you got to a place where for you self-defense is this, mm. then you have quite, by my definition and I, by how I teach, you fail. Mm. You fail because you had a lot of other moments to de-escalate. Yeah. I'm, I'm really happy you say that because um, like that's how I, 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 I know I know a lot of people like to take like the I'm not a spiritual person, but people don't do talk about other stuff in, in Krav Maga from a traditional perspective because it's like, oh, it's all about that thing. And I'm like, OK, well, look at what's going on right now in society. If you're not aware that there's a riot downtown because you don't watch the news and you're like, mm, I'm going to go to lunch downtown, you screwed up. Um, yeah. And, you know, I've, I've, people have given me shit that I talk about politics or what's going on as part of the self-defense aspect. Uh, and I'm like, we're in an unstable time in the world. And as a Jew, I'm thinking <laughs> like a Jew in Germany in the 19, late 1920s, early 1930s. And it's like, you got to be aware, like things change. Like there's something called yeah. the, the normalcy bias where, uh, where we see this, that everyone like almost all humans get caught up in it where they're like, yesterday was fine. Today is fine. Oh, I, those warnings are, eh, it's going to be fine tomorrow. And then boom, it's not, you know? Yeah. Um, and I, and it also the, dictates the nature of the threat. You, as yeah. you, as, a, as an instructor, you have to understand the political environment because it dictates the nature of the threat. The, I teach a lot here how the threats we face change by where we are. Mm. So if, if I go to the U.S., I'm probably, if I look at like baseball bat attacks, mm. I'm more likely to face someone baseball bat attacking me like this because in the US, everyone plays baseball. So mm. it's in the society, it's in the culture. Here in Australia, they don't play so much baseball. There's less, you, you see less baseball bat attacks. And when we do see attacks, it's more likely that it's a one-handed stick or something like that, just due to statistics. And this is purely due to where you are. And, mm. and politics also dictate the threat. Like you said, if I'm going now out and the nature of the threat these days is there's a riot and people armed with maybe uh, rocks throwing them or improvised weapon, I need to be aware of what? And I also mm. need to be aware of what tools I can use, right? More now in the rioting world and what's happening, more likely that I will have to use an improvised shield. Let's mm. learn how to work with improvised shield. Yeah. So you need to know the politics and the political environment, the situation of where you live, the community you live in, to understand the nature of the threat and to train properly uh, for the threat. Yeah. Definitely, definitely agree. Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, actually, in the military, you know, we're trained as an infantry soldier, but I ended up doing more police work, and I probably had more riot control experience than a lot of the police here. Uh, actually, when I was in the military, it was uh, 2010, and there was a very famous hockey riot of all things in can in my city vancouver and hockey what the riot. yeah hockey riot. They, they lost the championship and and people oh, smashed the whole downtown yeah it was funny I, I showed a picture of a burning car to my friends while i was at uh where was i uh, anyway I, i'll think of it later and i showed it to them and they're like what city in the west bank is that and i'm like no it's canada <laughs> it was, it's a very memorable well, moment but the uh, the police here were heavily criticized for not doing anything. Uh, they kind of just stepped back. And when I came back, and I'm like, no, they absolutely did the right thing. Because as someone who has had, you know, two, three hundred Palestinians with rocks throwing them at me and we had no riot control, I'm like, listen, if you instigate too quickly, people are going to start dying. And it's better to try to keep your distance if you can. And I, you know, it took a long time for me to convince a lot of people, like, you don't understand what mass violence looks like. Uh, it's not it's what you think. <laughs> it's the scariest thing. Mobs yeah. are the scariest thing in my eyes. Yeah. There's nothing scarier. The, they lose the mind, the, the human psychology around it. It's scary. And they end up doing things that the single person would never do. It's yeah. a crazy situation. And like you said, the only, the minute it explodes, there will be casualties on both sides and you want to yeah. minimize it and yeah. you know damage to property whatever you can fix you can uh, you can recover out of that but human lives lost and a lot of times these people who are rioting are good people are yeah. good people and uh, they just gotta kind of got caught in it it's yeah. not worth to take their lives for it. 
Yeah, it's it's not it's like a mob mentality, groupthink. I was actually uh, I'm reading an interesting book from a, a professor from Australia. Actually, uh, he was on Joe Rogan. Uh, it's called The Social Leap. Uh, William the von Hipp. Yeah, William von Hippel, and he was uh, he's talking about the the earliest invention of of humankind that made us different was the ability to throw rocks at the lions and then work as a group because one person with a rock is not good enough. They learn to work as a group and throw rocks collectively to fend off the uh, predators on the savanna. And uh, it became so important to learn that group mob mentality for survival mm -hmm. that if you didn't do it right, they'd kick you out of the group or they'd stone you themselves. And unfortunately, this evolutionary trait that was there then that was necessary is still here now. And we need to get rid of it, but it's going to take generations and and you're seeing the craziness the way, of the not, mob <laughs> i'm not sure you have to get rid of it we have yeah. a lot of like a lot of things that developed and evolved in us over the course of years yeah. that i think society now says that you have to dampen like yeah. male aggression for example mm. <laughs> i i not necessarily believe that that's the right thing i i i'm not even sure where my opinion stands mm. but i do believe that a lot of what brought us here can take us further away in yeah. a society. We just yeah. have to fit it to society. Yeah. Well, it's interesting you bring that up. It's a, it's a controversial topic, I'm doing air quotes, that shouldn't be a controversial topic because I think, personally, the biggest problem is, and, and all for equality in women, all, like I love, like my, my wife's doing amazing, like no problem, but young boys in high school need male role models. And the entire, almost the entirety of the education system in Western society, it's all women. And there's nothing wrong with women teaching little kids. That's what they excel at. But when we start getting older adolescents, when there's, there's, I, I mean, I'm not talking about abusive discipline in the school, schools, but if there's no like, hey, you cannot do that. And the kids yeah. are just like, fuck you and walk off like, uh, like here, like, no, I, it's ridiculous. I 100% agree. Yeah. yeah. So I've. Over the course of my time in Australia, I've become more a little bit more hippie, yeah. connected to my <laughs> spiritual side, yeah. into into you can say my softer side, mm. and and I definitely agree that especially kids they need this exposure to the two elements, to the two people, to men mm. and women. It doesn't have to be, by the way, from a father. I've mm. I've known plenty of fathers that shouldn't be in the lives of their child, mm. but I agree that they children need a male role model and female role model mm. and uh, and they need to see masculinity and what yeah. a healthy masculinity is yeah um, otherwise we lose a lot of what they can achieve and grow from yeah now like i'm uh, I, again i haven't been to australia and you're you're not originally from there so it's interesting to no. get your perspective that mm -hmm. especially sydney and uh, melbourne they're, they're weirdly woke but also really racist and i don't understand that dichotomy <laughs> yeah it, that's true i fi i find that it's quite unique because sydney sydney reminds me of israel in many ways especially tel aviv yeah. especially because of the variety of people that have here like probably the majority of my friends are not australian born and raised Mm. Right. The majority of my friends came here from South Africa, from France, from mm. uh, from Singapore, from everywhere. It's it's interesting and um, how there's such a big ver variety of people, and at the same time there's hatred and mm. there's um, there's a little bit of like racism in the background. Mm. It's very interesting to me to see that and to feel that and to feel that as well as an Israeli Jewish yeah. person here. Yeah. And with that, I feel that it's everywhere around the world. You yeah. know, in Israel, you are Ashkenazi. That is, you are you are Eastern European uh, Jewish. You mm. would have issues with Sephardics, with mm. uh, with like other other types of Jews. It's it's everywhere. I think it's inherent in in humans to be a bit worried of the other and to be judgmental of the other. But what I do see here in Sydney is that there is a big motion and a big move to change that. Mm. And that's what I think is important. It's not just where we are now. It's the fact that I can see a light that yeah. the society here and the culture here is moving. 
Yeah. Hopefully if we can not kill each other. <laughs> We're, yeah, by then. It's very dicey right now. Hopefully. Um, yeah. Yes, yeah, it's, it's interesting you brought that up because, like, I grew up like I'm not a religious Jew. I I, I don't need religion in my life uh, personally, but I understand why many people do. Uh, the Vancouver Jewish community is small and mostly not very religious. Um, I personally don't get along with the Jewish community here very well, but you know, whatever. Uh, w but when I went to Israel for the first time, it was interesting, and I noticed other Jews from North America made this observation: is that when you're a Jew in most cities in North America, uh, you're like a Jew and we're all Jewish and it doesn't matter. We're in the family. And then when you go there, you see that division. Because I remember, like I'm Ashkenazi, obviously, white as fuck. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I was uh, ha there for the first time with Ashkenazi friends and uh, they're Israeli. And I was like, I think I was in Sfat, I believe. And it's very Sephardic up there. And I was like, oh, man, the women here are beautiful. And he's like, you can't, you can't say that. They're, they're Sephardic. I'm like, what the fuck are you talking about? Like, what is wrong with you? And I didn't, I didn't realize that was the case. And, you know, I grew up where I grew up in Metro Vancouver. It's very Asian, like heavily Chinese. Like my wife's Chinese, too. And when you grow up, you start to see that actually everyone's a little bit racist. And we need to stop pretending like that's not the case. <laughs> and, it, you know, that was a big wake-up call, even amongst groups like in the muslim community uh the different types of muslims they don't like each other either you know uh, and uh i actually talk about this in my you know, i get weird looks or uncomfortable looks and i talk about culture as part of self-defense because you know certain things in one culture is going to piss off someone else in another culture and if you don't talk about it you're going to get in trouble uh you know it's it's this it's part of human nature and, and i think it's heavily part of self-defense it's just difficult to talk about. <laughs> but that's the reality. We, yeah. Humans are humans. And um, I, I'm a big proponent of, uh, uh, a big advocate of accepting reality. Mm. Uh, yes, correct. We should be enlightened and we should accept everyone regardless of sex, race, color and everything. But there is reality. And in mm. reality, humans are not perfect yet. And we have not been enlightened yet, if ever. Yeah. <laughs> we have to understand yeah. we have to understand who humans are what we are with our imperfections and how we can work around that mm. uh, and that's also part of krav maga yes yeah. there are areas in sydney that if me as a jewish person go with clear jewish signs i'm less safe in i'm less safe in i'm i'm aware of that and mm. that's uh, sadly that's the reality we're in Again, yeah. what I say that I love about Sydney is the fact that you can see that there is active work to change that. Mm. It, mm. But at the moment, we're not in a perfect world, yes. which is why we need Krav Maga. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, I, I mentioned I wanted to talk about that because like the Australian government or the province's stance, I just find reprehensible, particularly as a Jew. And in fact, they are trying to pull that shit where I am right now uh as because you know i can watch the media all i want but it's always better to talk to someone who's there um so yeah. what what is going on uh exactly well, there i i'll tell you one thing so I'll, I'll start with this i am as far from an expert on yeah. any of these subjects as, mm. as uh, anyone else if anything i try to minimize my consumption mm. of mm. information around them because i you know i i don't want to consume the stress and the anxiety that mm. they create and um, at the moment we're in lockdown we've been in lockdown for quite a while probably two months now it's going to be a three-month lockdown and mm. uh, the lockdown has had its ups and downs so it was a bit of a relatively easy lockdown can kind of still go to work it's suddenly a bit harder where you have to stay at home to do that and harder and harder and um, the lockdown where we're at now is on paper quite rough and for some people in some areas of Sydney, it is quite rough. That is, you're only allowed to leave the house for an hour a day to exercise or to go buy um, things. So it's quite hard for me. I live in a place called Bondi. It's mm -hmm. on the eastern suburbs of Sydney and very close to the beach. Here, uh, there haven't been many cases of, uh, of uh, COVID. So despite the fact that there is a lockdown, the police aren't enforcing it with a hard hand. 
as mm. much because there really was no no cases unlike areas in the west of sydney where there were hundreds of cases a day mm. and there they really enforce enforce it yeah. um i think the australian government probably did a lot of mistakes on the way to where we are now yeah. with how i think especially around uh, giving access to vaccinations earlier mm. australia kind of waited with that but again i'm no expert around it when yeah. we look at israel now israel was one of the first countries in the world to have the majority of its population vaccinated mm. and now israel is being hit very hard with the delta strait and uh, the hypocrisy and of it all People, yeah actually they say it might be because they started so early mm. so it was like a perfect storm israel started early over time the immunity level diminishes so those that got the vaccination earlier and now with the delta strain coming it kind of met together in this perfect storm mm. i don't know i don't know this is not my field and I'll, yeah. i'll tell you something i did learn from self-defense and fighting i try to consume my information and learn from the people who are at the top of their field. Yeah. So when I do boxing, I went to, when I did boxing and when I still do, I go to the best people I can find to learn mm -hmm. boxing from. Uh, my time is expensive and I'd rather pay that little extra for a PT with someone who's the best than save money and do it with some boxer size fitness code. Um, when I do Krav Maga, I want the best. I want the best person in the area that has the credentials, that has the background, that has the thing everything and same around the information regarding covid and stuff i wouldn't learn bjj by looking at a youtube video yeah. and uh, and i wouldn't decide bjj sucks because i saw a youtube video that says it sucks i will yeah. go and experience it for myself which i have and i think now society is in a place where people consume their information online in yeah. the shallowest of ways and it And at the same time, they consume such shallow information, they make such hard, hard decisions yeah. and, and beliefs. And that's why I'm, I'm very cautious talking about whether yeah. Australia did the right thing or do I agree or disagree, because I know that there is a panel of experts that, that, that kind of guide these decisions. And maybe they're doing the right thing, maybe not. I, yeah. I, I don't know. Do well, I yeah. trust the government? Yeah. Probably not. But nobody does anymore. <laughs> yeah, nobody does. But who yeah. else would I trust? I definitely don't trust myself around. Yeah. It. Well, like and... for me, like uh, I, I agree. Like, because when they say trust the experts on this, again, I'm not an expert on this either. But you know what I did do? I went and read research papers from the actual researchers, yeah. not what the government experts are saying. Yeah. And what you find is there's a. Do uh, you know the game Broken Telephone? Yeah. For yeah. Sure. So it's for like. Sure what the actual research scientists are saying versus what the political medical experts are saying and then what the policy are saying are completely detached from each other to the point where now, you know, tens of thousands of medical doctors and researchers are like, fuck the system, I'd rather lose my license. And, and, and I understand that, you know, the tariff, uh, to me, I do consider this self-defense because I've been talking to my students a lot about mental health this past year and uh and that don't based on what i'm seeing in the research and the death numbers and who's dying and all that stuff i'm like guys there's the first month i was like oh fuck but i'm like we need to stop fearing this thing because the experts even at the beginning of the pandemic i'm talking about uh, world-class virologists and immunologists were like this thing is gonna stay it's gonna be here we're gonna have to deal with it they said that last year they said that now they're saying this now and i'm like i just don't understand the madness around this all like our uh in canada they originally said 70 percent vaccination rate among adult public and for the most part in areas you know they hit that where i am i think they hit they say they just announced today like 700,000 people are not vaccinated and the rates are the hospitals are fine everyone is fine but today they announced everyone 12 and over must be vaccinated no exceptions too bad we don't tolerate this kind and it's like what the fuck crack are you guys smoking but you know there's a lot of people who've been terrified by the misinformation or the little bits of information uh And they're just so scared. They're like, we have to do it. And I'm like, dude, you're not going to drop dead. Whether you're vaccinated or not, you're probably fine. Especially if you're like a Krav Maga student, you're healthy. Have you found like I, when that's the case so, in Australia? 
I, I find that here they are a bit more, even the government, the language they use and how they push vaccination and things is less aggressive. Mm. The, the be, people view the behaviors of the lockdown, etc., is a little bit aggressive. But I think that if I look at around the world, the, is, the Australia isn't acting any different than any other country. Mm, yeah. Um, I agree around consuming that for like self-defense as well, mental self-defense. Yeah. Stay, stay away. Stop looking at the numbers every day. Stop, yeah. stop putting stress on yourself. That's self-defense as well. But I do think that we are dealing with a very dangerous situation. There mm. is something going on. There is a disease that's killing people, millions of people by now. And I know people that haven't died from it, but got long-term repercussions or mm. lung heart issues. So I do know that there's an issue and self-defense is also taking self-defense actions. I I don't know. I, I'm sure there's more to the picture. I'm mm. sure there's more to I don't know if they want to put a chip in me and, uh, and <laughs> connect me to my phone with 5G. Yeah. But maybe, maybe as by the way, everything has, maybe the pharmaceutical companies want to make more money. So uh. they... Okay, but I do know that there is some viral disease going that's that's very dangerous. I do know I'm going to get my um, my vaccination because I teach people, I work with people, mm. I want to reduce my ability to transmit it. More than that, whether is the government doing the right thing? Rarely they do, but mm -hmm. I don't know how to comment about it. I've yeah. also seen the research you, you talk about, and I see research everywhere, and I mm. see research papers being retracted. I love reading research and over the years I've gotten a little bit better, definitely not at the level of, of what I would say a scientist, but a little bit better at mm. reading it instead of just going for the abstract or going for the conclusion, I go through it and try and process it. But I'm still very cautious around this. I am a Krav Maga expert. You want mm. to know how to do Krav Maga? Come to me. I will work with you. I understand violence. I've studied it. I've, I've lived it for the past probably 10 years. Am I the person to tell you, no, you shouldn't drink fluoride in your water and definitely don't get the vaccination? Don't take that from me. Mm. You know, that's that's my view. That's yeah. my view around well, it. Yeah, be educated, open mind. I, exactly. Freedom of choice, exactly. I think that's the best way. Like I, I'm just, as a Jew again, I, I'm seeing the way governments are acting and I'm I'm quite scared personally because I think it's it's going to lead to violent it's already leading to violence in some countries yeah. and and uh this 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 current trend towards like authoritarian behavior regardless of their justification just because yeah. you're seeing left-wing governments right-wing governments all doing the same, thing, the same thing and and i'm just scared because i'm like ah we've seen this before and and, yeah. and you know at, at the you know a year ago it would be a little little bit ridiculous to suggest uh oh they're gonna go authoritarian and they're gonna go like early nazi germany this year we're seeing it though in some some countries not all countries and i just i don't know what to think about it because i mean you guys don't have guns in uh, australia so much but here luckily, luckily yeah well it's it's relative like in canada we, you know it's interesting you say that because like in canada we have despite what our government says there is a big gun culture here predominantly to do with hunting it's a hunting, hunting culture yeah. is huge here and sports yeah. shooting is big here um which i think can, is great by the way yeah i, I love that uh, and you like you know you you can have pistols and rifles and you need a background check to get to get a gun which i agree with and, and you have to take a course i teach the course the course isn't ideal but it's it's better than nothing and there's some laws that are good and bad but the bottom line is we don't have the kind of ridiculous shooting problem that america does and I find everyone focuses, and, and America's problem is deeper than their gun laws. It's, it, I think it's a mental health issue, personally. Because mm -hmm. um, like if you're labeled like, seriously mentally ill here, you cannot have a gun. They'll take it away from you. They'll pull the license. And it's not an issue. And, and for the most part, uh, the police support gun ownership. There are those heavily politicized who do not. Like I, w I was very much against New Zealand's decision to take guns because of one incident. I don't really support Australia's stance to have no guns either. Because of that reason, I see the way the world is going. And I'm like, I don't like governments, the, what they're doing. And I think it's important to have firearms. Like we can't carry firearms for self-defense here. 
And I don't even shoot that much because it's expensive, but I have them. I know how to use them. They're there. Um, but in Australia, if shit hits the fan, you guys, you guys don't have that much. <laughs> I mean, depends what depends on what shit, right? Yeah. Uh, I don't know if uh, if having civilians armed is what will solve most of the threats that we have coming to us. Yeah. Um, if if we can look at it. Uh, definitely, I don't see a bunch of civilians, you know, taking the government here. What is yeah. it in the government? What are going to take the Capitol Hill? Yeah. Right. Just let the but kangaroos they, out, right? Exactly. <laughs> well, last time they went for a fight with kangaroos, I think yeah. they lost. Yeah, there was right. The emos, there was, have you heard of it? There was the big yeah, emo did. war. It's yeah. funny. <laughs> it's funny. Yeah. yeah, no, it's it's a complicated situation. We live mm. in, in a complicated world, and it's complicated on many many layers. Definitely. Mm. How has it? How has this affected your classes? How has that affected your ability to teach Krav Maga? Uh, that's a good, well. I think I'm pretty public about it now. Is that so? This the up until now, they were not being so draconian. They were so. I live in British Columbia, which is one. It's the westernmost province in Canada. So then you have, you know you have Quebec and Ontario uh, now several other provinces were having just absolutely draconian lockdowns you can't do anything now in the first you know like everybody the first lockdown everyone's like oh shit so you know within two weeks I had Zoom classes running and uh, bottom line is people are not interested in doing Kramaga via Zoom unless you have a giant global organization with thousands and thousands of people and then you can get like a twenty person class. Um, yeah. So, you know, I did it and my, my focus originally was, listen, I switched it to 30 minute hit kind of thing and then going over some drills because my focus there was to keep people in shape because even then, based on the research, I wanted people to stay healthy to if they did 100%. get COVID. Uh, and then when they eased off a little bit, we opened up classes again and there was no issues, none. Uh, COVID wasn't spreading amongst the uh, gyms, uh, even like Texas and Florida that in America, they never shut down, no issues. But then the second wave came in the winter, which is normal. It's the flu season, essentially. So any kind of coronavirus is going to pop up. And it, yeah. But the governments didn't do anything, like nothing to prepare for this. And then they just said, you all have to shut down again. But in that time, there's a little bit more hesitancy. And this is pre-vaccine. And Let's just say a large, not everyone, but a large percentage of schools stayed open. Once they figured out that the police here in this province were not really enforcing it, uh, they stayed open. And those who wanted to come mm -hmm. came. Those who didn't, obviously business suffered dramatically. Now, Canada is what would be considered a bit more socialist uh, of a country as compared to, say, America. The government federally and provincially handed out a fair amount of money. Uh, a lot of it's in a loan form, which isn't great. Uh, that kept me afloat and many people afloat. It's not enough, though, if, say, they continued permanent lockdowns indefinitely. Now, I'm not sure what's going to happen because I've been operating fairly regularly now since the last three or four months because there was no restrictions again. But now with these new mandatory vaccine things, I don't know what's going to happen because uh, a lot of the gyms don't want to enforce that. A lot of the police don't want to enforce that. The government might, in fact, be breaking federal and their own law. I'm not really sure. It's not clear yet. Some of the claims made by the politicians. So it's it's a really tough position because they're basically saying if you don't get vaccinated, you can't do anything. But it's a bit contradictory because behind the scene they're like oh but if you get rapid antigen testing every day you're fine now in our province they just said no nothing which i don't think is going to hold up in court because it's silly like as long as you test negative it's like okay fine who cares um so i'm not sure where it's going to get but a lot of people like we haven't had violence here yet and i'm not going to get involved in that shit but i think things are about to get violent here because they they basically decided to go medical tyranny and say you must do this or else so i'm not sure how that's going to affect my business now <laughs> i finally got things back to running normally students are coming back everything's been going well and, then, yeah. and they pull this bullshit and i and i am 
very disappointed and almost disgusted now at some of the martial arts community or some humans who basically said, we have to do what we're told to get back to normal. And I'm like, huh? That doesn't make sense. If you want to do what you want to do, go do it. But that attitude to me, again, as a Jew from history is like, fuck you. Like, I, I'm just, uh, as I said, I, I might be agitated today. You know, uh, my family is very pissed off right now. I'm very pissed off. Uh, it's scary to me that this is happening. Like, I wasn't scared up until this point. And now I'm just like, fuck. Like, my wife was like, let's move to Texas. But I don't know how we can do that. And I don't want to abandon my students. I'm not sure so, you would agree with Texas as a, any better than you agree with where you're at, right? Yeah. Well, no, I just because Texas lets you do what you want. Like, at they're the encouraged. Moment. Yeah, at, at the, the moment. moment. Remember, there everyone has guns there. They're not gonna. Yeah. <laughs> they're not gonna be able to do that there. So mm -hmm. it's. Uh, I've tried my best to be informed and educate, and I'm very much for everyone makes their own choice for this virus. Like, if it was a virus that every you were seeing bodies drop in the street and everyone was dying, I'd be different. But and, you know, you have to take everything as it is for what it is. So we'll see how my business goes now. I finally got it back to normal and I have no, no idea now because I suspect a lot of people are not going to want to come anymore. Uh, yeah, it, it's definitely an issue we've been facing, right? After the yeah. first lockdown, we, we took a, quite a lethal hit, but we managed to just start recovering. And then again, yeah. we've been. Have you found that people's interests changed since then? since the lockdowns so are people more interested in sports more interested in boxing less interested in crab has that had any effect on well i would say i've seen a massive increase in inquiries and in st new student trials whether they stay really? or not yeah people are scared you know whether or not you're pro-vax whether you got the vax it's irrelevant uh people are looking around the world right now and they're scared and they're thinking, whether they admit it to me or not, I know that's what's going on. Because I've never seen, uh, Krav is not popular here. So to see this level of interest all of a sudden, it could be because of the pent up, like stuck for a year, not doing anything. And people are saying, well, I finally want to try that thing I've never tried. Yeah. And it's a little bit of fear that they see the world is not. You know, I've been saying to students like, oh, without sounding conspiratorial, the worst thing that could happen in my city is an earthquake because they've been saying that forever. It happens every 300 to 700 years and uh, it's due. They, they were using fear in the, in the 90s saying it's going to happen, be prepared. I know for a fact our local government is completely fucked if the big earthquake actually happens. They're completely not prepared. And so I'll tell people, you saw how people were with the toilet paper here. Like, we make toilet paper here. We, they were like, we're not going to run out in my province. And they, they make it right here. Now. Yeah. And people were losing their shit. And I'm like, imagine if all of a sudden we have a magnitude 8 earthquake here, which is, is, is not unrealistic. You're fucked societally here because the government tells you be prepared for three days. I'm like, at least two weeks. And if they can't get stuff back together in two weeks, we're on our own New Orleans style for a few years, re just practically. And I'm seeing that kind of, and I use that as an example, because I know people, if I talk about COVID or other, they roll their eyes. But if I talk about that earthquake, about preparedness, it's a bit more uh, I tangible. I find it funny that yeah. what people buy is toilet paper. Yeah, I know, you know? right? I know, the apocalypse <laughs> is here, toilet paper. Yeah, yeah. 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 But it uh, also shows, by the way, for me, in a way, if I can redirect it to mm -hmm. Kormaga, how people don't understand self-preservance and, mm. preservance and, and self-defense. The fact that they target toilet paper. <laughs> it, it shows you yeah. the average Joe, right? The, the first thing I would expect to run out of the shelves is food. Mm. But toilet, toilet paper. paper. Yeah, because people are emotional creatures and they think, oh, no, I need my toilet. And they hear toilet paper, so they run to get that. Yeah. And then it's interesting how in reality that will be probably one of your least big problems if, yeah. uh, if something yeah. hits. Yeah. Well, that's a, you know, that's a, well, you could do it too in Australia, but here like food wise, I, I can go hunting, but it's not an issue. Yeah. Like yeah. I'll eat we a can. crow if I have to, like I have, yeah. you just shoot a crow, eat the, eat the damn crow. Yeah. Well, like, I don't I, have a gun here to shoot a yeah, crow, right? Yeah. But, go back uh, to rocks <laughs> yeah. and trap it. Yeah. 
No, no, it is it is an issue. And here as well, right? Again, I mean, this beautiful Bondi ran mm. out of toilet paper, out of stress for people. Yeah. And here, there's no access to hunting. There's no no definitely not enough birds to feed everyone. Mm. And even yeah. fishing in this area is very problematic. Yeah, so, you got the sharks there, the great whites of game. We got a shark, <laughs> but I guess I don't know if you're the one eating it or it's eating you. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, people actually, because the Chinese, they eat them here, but I don't. <laughs> yeah, well, that's probably hard to do, you know, with yeah. your bare hands, get a shark. Yeah. Um, what, what do you teach in your gym? So you teach Krav Maga, do you teach any other martial arts? Yeah, so I mean, uh, so I what I'm teaching is I teach Krav Maga, right? But it's self-defense, yeah. right? I know a lot yeah. of Israelis are like, Krav Maga, like the cultural thing. I'm like, no, no, no but Krav Maga is just an approach to self-defense. So, you know, I, I originally was with, uh, like many years ago, IKMF. And like many people, I was I didn't like the way they did stuff. Just very rigid. They're, they weren't developing fighting. And it just, I branched out. You know, I learned a little bit of boxing, a little bit of kickboxing, uh, 2008, I started jujitsu. Uh, I've been doing that. Uh, no, 2012. Sorry, I started jujitsu. 2008 was Krav Maga, and I love jujitsu. I do it as much as I can. Not as much as I'd like, but as much as I can. And I realized, you know, like you and many people, there there's gaps in the combat skills. So I I developed my own curriculum as a result of working with multiple organizations. Like I'm certified under four different ones. I'd love to be certified under more if they let me and I have the time and the money, but COVID, yeah, whatever. Um, so what I do is I have a beginner curriculum, a novice curriculum, and an advanced curriculum. And I broke it up into the beginner white belt curriculum is your base of combatives, punching, kicking, moving, striking, sparring, your basic 360 and knife defense, straight line knife defense. What happens if someone, you know, char those self-defense situations, basic uh, choking, just if, you know, aggressive, someone tries to choke you and falling and getting up from the ground. And I take about six months to go through everything. And then I just repeat that every six months. And then when someone has been around six months, a year, depending on their skill level and assessment, they can go challenge the tests. And my, my testing is very military inspired because the goal while i want to see your techniques the goal of my test is to push at every level is to push them to their limits and while i want to see ideal technique i don't expect it and i want you to be saying in every test fuck you i hate you why did i sign up for this because i want them to realize that they can push through it if they have to in, in the Krav Maga style so once they get through to the next one you know i have a yellow and orange belt testing at each level but the novice class is that, and that's where I start looking at, okay, now that you've really got self-defense in your head and what that means, now I'll teach you boxing, kickboxing, wrestling, basic judo as basic combative skills, as well as add on to the advance, uh, expand on the knife stuff and, and slowly ramp it up, as well as uh, more Krav Maga security-oriented takedowns for, for those situations. And then once they get their green belt, which usually takes three to five years, I've only made, I don't know, seven or eight of them in since 2013. Uh, then I start teaching that the fun Krav Maga stuff, you know, the gun, the military police application, which everyone wants to learn. But let's be honest, for most people, it's not self-defense. It's not required. But uh, like the gun stuff, for example, I have to be careful in Canada how I phrase it because... You can't purchase a gun for self-defense in Canada, but if I look at legal cases, people have used guns in self-defense. Um, but you shouldn't, according to the law. But you can. It's complicated. But so the way I'll say is, listen, I need you to understand how to use a gun, a uh, rifle, shotgun, pistol, because never say never, you could have like a, a active shooter situation. And, and everyone has this John Wick idea that they're going to take that gun away and they're going to be proficient. And I'm like, what if their friend has a gun? What if they know combat too and they take it back from you? If you don't know how to use it proficiently in that situation, you're dead. Uh, and so I give the basic understanding of how to use these. Teaching uh, the way I was taught in the military, just the drill method for the guns. It's actually very fast. A very uh, excellent way to teach people firearms, like the dry fire stuff, rapid, just go over, go over. Uh, I once taught a uh, Taiwanese Secret Service guy in like a week the basics. He he went around the world. He tra he trains working with Taiwan around the world. He had a Mossad guy say, allegedly Mossad guy say, "Where'd you learn? Have you been to Israel?" I was like, "No, right." So that the, the Israeli methodology works very effective at teaching people very quickly. 
And then I teach people like how to arrest people. Because if you're, if you've stuck around at that point, for me, that's, you know, three to five years, I trust you. I also require people to get their firearms license at that point. That way they do a background check that's not on me, it's on the police. And if you can't get that card, I'm like, listen, if you can't get that, the firearms license, you don't need to learn that stuff. Because either you had a, a criminal history or whatever, and I, I don't need to teach you that stuff. I have no problem teaching anyone basic self-defense as long as you're no longer doing that garbage anymore. Everyone has a right to it. But at that point, it's okay. You're either serious about learning everything to do with self-defense or you need it for job application, for policing, for military. Um, because as you know, teaching civilians very different than police or very different uh, very for military, which I find a lot of instructors struggle with because they just lack either the knowledge or the training. I, I personally don't think you have to have been a police officer or military to be able to teach police or military. It helps. But if you want to, you better damn well go get the proper training to compensate yeah, for it. Um, how do you handle that kind of topic in, in, in Australia? It's probably very difficult over there, that the more advanced sort of. Uh, uh, here we have a lot of, it's, it's hard. I find, I find that finding basically that law enforcement in general here don't recognize Krav Maga enough, don't know what Krav Maga is enough. We're having a hard time educating about that and also when they come to do my classes which some do i can separate what they need to know to what the general population need to know so i i serve the majority of civilians basically i'd say civilian mm -hmm. and um, i didn't get to teach and work with law enforcement specifically to run workshops here because again they have a lot of bureaucratic issues uh, from funding to just the idea of going into a business and doing it doesn't work or doesn't sit well with them. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so we have that, but I definitely agree. I've never been a police officer, mm -hmm. uh, but I've worked with police officers. The, the, the fact that you don't need to have been there to teach it, mm -hmm. as long as you get the correct certificates, correct training, you, you understand the nature of the threat, and you have the required tools to transfer the required information to them. Mm. Um, definitely. Of course, I was in the army, so I have stuff I can take from the army and, and replicate it to law enforcement. Mm. But again, the nature of a, a, a police officer is very different from what you do in the army and, the, um, and what other types of law enforcement and what a security guard needs to know. Mm. So. I am a big believer in molding the, the material to the requirements. I mm. don't think there is one size fits all, mm. definitely. Yeah, um, for yeah. sure. That's why I tried like to, to build it in that level so that my student, by the time they get a black belt, they actually mm -hmm. can do all of it because most people like want the basic stuff so most yeah. people stick around white yellow belt and then they fuck off unfortunately for my business but you know how it is um yeah, natural. and then really develop them up because like uh, globally we're finding that police are lacking just every expert everywhere that actually gives a shit is like they need more training guys why won't you pay for more training uh because it doesn't get people elected that's why but that that's the truth and you know the the skill level required to get to that policing level so they they don't they don't keep having these incidents it, it's it you have to build people up to it you can't like i i hate i hate like oh come to my four-hour seminar and i'm never gonna see any of you again because oh and i learned to defend myself this weekend no you didn't like the the crime guy is easy to learn when taught correctly like i don't like to teach techniques that will take a month just to be able to get around but i the idea that it's you can learn it in a seminar or a month and then you never need to train again is insane and i despise whoever thought yeah. that was a good idea for marketing yeah. in the krav maga community because it just it bastardized it and i think it's the reason a lot of people don't respect it because they think it's not a serious thing sometimes because of that attitude yeah i um, teach um i teach a women's of defense workshop mm -hmm. called unleashed mm -hmm. and it's a, it's a two-hour workshop for women and i always start it with I'm not going to teach you anything in these two hours. Yeah. You're not going to teach you anything. And yeah. that's the reality. What can you teach a person in two hours? What can you teach a woman 
about the violence she's going to face and the tools to, that she she can have to to deal with that. With that, I try and equip them with as much information as I can. I try to simplify. I I wouldn't say diluted, but I even simplified the basics to maybe give them a single tool. But most of what we do in that workshop is we try and break down situation and understand what we can do in them and apply what they already have tools these women already have in them. Because in two hours, I can't equip you with a new tool. I can't give you a skill. Skill takes a long yeah. time to practice. Yeah. And I agree with all of these law enforcement workshops and stuff. That's not the solution to anything. The solution mm. is regular training. You don't just have to train it. It has to be in your mind. It's not enough that you do it once a week. You have to think about it. It has to kind of like, you have to immerse yourself in whatever you're doing. And mm. I think police officers, the main issue is due to funding or whatever, they don't immerse themselves enough in the need to develop their skills. They immerse themselves in the day-to-day -day job that mm. they have to do. Yeah, and, and it's a hard job at that. Uh, people a very hard job. People, I I wonder because uh, Australia is obviously very different. But uh, w was there any defund the police movement in Australia at all? Like I, I don't actually know. Um, no, I don't think it was as big as um, as it was in the U.S. There yeah. were some calls, but overall, I think the police here are doing a good job and are accepted by the community. Mm. Yeah. If anything, their issue here is the funding lack yeah. of funding yeah you know consistently yeah. 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 Consistent. yeah like like here in canada for the most part uh you know the when that whole movement started people went into the city councils and the city councils politely said yeah we heard you get out so thank god they didn't do that here but there's still an issue with training quality uh, um the okay. police here aren't that bad like compared compared to all the screw-ups in the states you know, screw-ups happen here, but it's not as consistent. Uh, and most of the cases of, you know, quote, police abuse here are not. They're just a misunderstanding of the public. There was, there's definitely 100% an issue historically between the police and the natives here, as is with Australia. But uh, that's starting to get sort of looked at now, though yeah. the trust is gone between the natives and the police. But... Uh, general public generally is okay with them here as well but as i said i've had many police students actually I haven't said i've had many police students over the years they barely stick around they don't they don't have time to, in their head at least uh and they don't develop their skills beyond what and many of it's because it's a legal concern they're like i don't want to learn something that uh because karamic has the image of like killing people you know it, it, yeah but, um, I wonder how that image came to be, you know? I mean, I know how. It's marketing, <laughs> probably marketing, but yeah. at the time, I think it came from marketing in the U.S. when yeah. into the U.S. market. Well, uh, maybe because, like, uh, I'm not going to name names, but the individuals who heavily brought uh, Krav Maga to the Krav U.S. and North America, yeah. they actually watered it down to the point where it's hardly Krav Maga anymore. But, you know, even for me, working with different organizations, like, they never taught police stuff and i only know because i my experience in the military was essentially police work and also uh, i branched out to many organizations so like i learned from uh near maman ct 707 and he has a, a lot a lot of police and uh, counterterrorism experience so the way he teaches krav maga it, it started to give me Very some different. ideas and then uh you know, i train with uh, uh ikf amit himmelstein and i actually find what they're teaching is heavily heavily security and police oriented so i actually take what they're teaching and if i say have a police officer come to do private lessons i for the most part focus on what that organization is teaching because it actually works really well for for police but if i was to take what a standard organization taught i wouldn't know how to teach police um and so if the big big names run things the way they do and run their instructor courses the way they do then it's impossible for these instructors to understand how to teach police properly and i think that's probably where it comes from unless the instructor themselves is a police officer or or yeah. military but then that doesn't always make them good instructors <laughs> so it's also it's yeah. not enough that you're a police officer you need yeah. to be a police officer understands the threats 
in that specific yeah. precinct or whatever you call it of of uh, where you're teaching. Yeah. Again, the threats a police officer in Tel Aviv in Israel faces very different than a police yeah. officer in Quebec, Canada, yeah. right? Yeah. Like, and uh, and the procedures there's a different law. You can yeah. put your knee on their neck. You can't put their knee on their neck. You need to say this. You can't say this. Very different. Yeah. And it's it's complicated teaching. Yeah. It, what? Because I know a lot of after the ugh, this group think of the, that whole incident. Like the amount of for me, I am for teaching knee on or shin on the neck rather than knee. Knee it's too easy to slip, but shin. I've used it before as a smaller guy. I'm five six. I'm not that big. Against a lot larger people, I need that technique, even if it's for a few seconds, in order to control people sometimes. And I, saw, I don't know. I mean, you can tell me what your thoughts are, but I saw some pretty high level people just jump behind that the whole like, well, you can never do that technique ever. And I'm just like, I don't understand. What do you think about that? Uh, when I teach civilians, I teach them the most efficient things I know. I don't yeah. care if legal, illegal, whatever. It's it's bullshit, by the way. Legal, yeah. illegal isn't for a yeah. civilian, isn't dictated in the moment. It's not mm. that the police officer will come and say, ah, your knee was here. Mm. You will have to go to court and you will have to explain yourself and why you did so. And, um, and the issue of where your knee was, where your shin was, rarely will it play a, play a factor mm. in... Um, in what you can say, in basically the result of the of the court case. Yeah. And um, so when I work with civilians, I always teach them the most efficient thing. And I mm. agree. Put your leg on their neck. Put your shin. Put your weight there. Definitely way better than putting it on their back or being yeah. off them. And um, especially when, when we deal with strength and size differences. Yeah. I'll teach them the fingers in the eye when you can. I'll teach them the the painful, the thing, the the full rear naked, mm. everything. And then, of course, I'll explain the issues around it. I'll explain the correct timing to use it, etc. Um, but yeah, I'm I'm not. I don't try to like think of the legalities and stuff around. It's not my role. Legality yeah. isn't dictated. Yeah. Uh, Very Israeli mentality. I don't care what they say. I'm teaching them what works. Because uh, look, like if, if you... someone feels, <laughs> if someone, if someone is in a life or death situation, and yeah. they feel through, and the situation escalated to a place where they need to put their leg on someone's neck, um, I, I think whether it's the knee, the leg, the on, the off is not the important part. It's the yeah. fact that they got into that place. Yeah. And if they're in that place, they need. The most efficient tools. Yeah. With that, a lot of time, that I I wouldn't say I I get people who don't fit my vision out of the gym, but I feel that as a head instructor and as a community, we attract people who are the non-aggressive people, the people who don't want to hurt others, the people who understand the severity of violence and don't want to take part in it. Uh, and as such, when I equip them with these tools, it's usually because I trust that they understand when, why, and how they should use them. Uh, like you said, it's not that like police, uh, a criminal check or no criminal check. It's mm. you, you know the people who come to you. Mm. And yeah, so I, I, when, when I teach them, I try to teach them the best things I know. I'm not like mm. withholding. Look, if you put your shin on their neck, it's better, but I'm not teaching. I teach them yeah. everything. Now, because uh, Australia, every every city's got different demographics. What what kind of people come into your class? I think my average student is probably somewhere between twenty to thirty five. Mm. Um, two thirds are men. Um, people who are one of their major major drives is fitness and health. Mm. Uh, even if they say it's self defense. Um, yeah, what, what I found is actually the Australian culture and the Australian people are are fighters in there. They have like a fighting yeah. spirit. A little bit. <laughs> yeah, a just bit. a bit. <laughs> I I was in New York for, for a few months at the time and trained with them there. And I, I thought that the nature of contact here mm. in Australia, they are more used to it mm. here. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. I think maybe it's because of the sport they play, rugby, AFL, mm. something, or the culture, or or something. But Australians are heavy fighting spirit in them. Surprisingly, mm. I, I found quite a lot of that here. It didn't yeah. feel any different than teaching in Israel for me. Mm. While yeah. uh, when I was around the world, I, I felt different 
yeah. different, you can say, well, like, or Yeah, something. like here, I have to basically start a little slow sometimes. Sometimes I throw people in bowls because uh, Canada is a country full of anxious people for no fucking reason that makes no sense and they have no self-confidence and they avoid violence and uh, I have to really? get get people to be I, I know that's right yeah. um well Vancouver is a very very relative to other big cities is super safe like really safe uh, yeah there's a drug issue here and a homeless issue but the homeless and druggies here are not that violent and sure, people make that they make you feel uncomfortable, and I I avoid them because a lot of them have schizophrenia, and I just don't want to deal with that. Mm-hmm. But compared to other places, it's really safe. And anyone, anytime I have a student who comes in and be like, "Vancouver is really violent," I'm like politely like, "Shut the fuck up! No, it's not. You know nothing. You could be in fucking Kabul right now." Yeah. Um, and I imagine, you know, I imagine Sydney is relatively safe as well. Very um, safe. Very safe. But the difference is just the overall cultural mentality. Because I know I have Australian students. They're all like, rah, let's like kick the shit out of each other. And I'm like, hey, can you develop your technique a little bit more as well as wanting to kick the shit out of people? Versus the Canadians, I have to like get it out of them sometimes. Uh, And wake it up in them. Yeah. Yeah. And I've found, well, I've actually found it's easier to, if they're willing to, easier to get people to be aggressive than it is to get someone who's really aggressive to calm the fuck down because mm-hmm. usually there's something more going on gone with that person or they just love it and they can't, uh, yeah. um, you know, because I get big, you know, the comment, if you're big, you need to learn more techniques and I get the big athletic guys and I'm a smaller guy so I can only do so much with them. I don't like to do private lessons with, with big guys. It's just not. They're <laughs> not going to get much out of it from me. Um but it's like, hey, as a bigger person, you need to learn your technique as well because, you know, that jury does look at you differently. And also from a physics perspective, you can just smack people and they go away. Uh, and I find that's actually harder to get people to do is calm down than to build it up. Uh, I don't know if you found that in, in, uh, in Australia. Yeah, definitely, being, definitely. They're rowdy. It's always <laughs> a challenge. It's always yeah. a challenge whether you need to equip them with aggression which is like you said here as well it's the majority of the work and it's not just here in the israeli army right in basic training that's the majority of the time spent learning to be aggressive learning to go from zero to a hundred aggression on the bag work 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 and then with that aggression focus on the thing shoot it's it's a lot of aggression training that's i think the main thing by the way the difference between army training to civilian army majority aggression Civilian, yeah. a little bit of aggression, yeah. but it's always part of the training. And yeah. not only part of the training, it's, I feel, probably the most important element mm. for self-defense. Yeah. The ability for a person to wake up, okay, I'm in violent confrontation, I'm being hit, I'm in a fight for my life now, I can no longer try and control the situation, time to turn vicious, time to unleash, time mm. to go in. Yeah, yeah. I would agree, fun. yeah. Because I, I, I tell my students, like, listen, I'm teaching you the techniques that I feel work for the most people most of the time, have a higher success rate. But all techniques always will fail eventually, and you need to turn it on and be ready to go violent, which is, is it, it is a little difficult to train full on here because people, they, they can't take it. If I go like four hours, just like go crazy. Uh, also, there's a... North Americans, I don't know, Australians, they struggle with the whole control. Like you can go Thai style where you're training hard but not hurting each other. And people yeah. really, really have a hard time with that here, especially the bigger guys. Uh, and I imagine Australia, it's probably similar. They, if you go too hard for too long, there's like bodies on the floor, metaphorically. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, my, what I've been focusing on for the past probably five, six years is the teaching methodology that is okay, have everything I was taught, like I told you, and I'm going to teach it, but how do I break it in a way that will not just equip people with this skill fast and efficiently, but safely? Mm. How can I do it? So uh, I've been playing a lot with transferring the aggression from the shield to the thing, to how do I isolate and work on everything so we can push people, keep them as aggressive in the safest manner. For me, safety is the most important thing. If someone gets injured, and they now can train for two weeks, it's it's a major failure for them, for me as well. So it's always this balance. 
um, that I find, and this is what I constantly think of, constantly. Mm-hmm. How can I improve the training? What can I do better? How can I change it? That's always my greatest challenge. It's not how to teach this technique better, how to, it's how to get them as close to reality in the most efficient way and safest way. And I've been playing a lot with it. It's a never ending journey, understanding, teaching metholo- methodologies and, yeah. and everything. Yeah. yeah. And I, and so on that note, like I, I, I did a study psychology in school. I ended up just with my associates because I needed to get the fuck out of university as an older person. I can't deal with those <laughs> idiots. Um, yeah. but I, I incorporate a lot of that, like the, the psychology, like the mental awareness, like the nervous system. Um, it's, it's especially important in Canada where, as I said, everyone's anxious and nervous about nothing all the goddamn time. I think Australians are a little bit more relaxed, uh, in that sense, yeah, probably the this, anxiety everywhere. Yeah, it's the human yeah. condition these days. Yeah. So how, how do you like, do you have any specific, like I, for example, uh, one of the things I teach is actually not from Karma Guy. It's uh, the Jeff Cooper mental color code. So white, yellow, orange, red, and then black, mm-hmm. where you panic. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I've found a way to teach it where I can teach it using that same model for your mental health day to day, but also in a self-defense situation, just to check in like, oh, threat um, level or- yeah, as like, wh- where's your nervous system at? And are you going to be able to make a rational decision if you need to? Or do you need to calm down? Or do you need to run because you feel yourself getting overwhelmed and you're going to pass out? Uh, or if you're I, just I found, at home, you know? I found that in, for me, what worked the best with my students is instead of um, structuring it, that is red, yellow, or those that I've seen quite, quite a lot to do, they it hasn't worked so well for my students what Mm. worked for us was actually just isolating situations breaking them and understanding what you may or might may not feel in every moment Mm. and then we i kind of laugh about it a lot that my students came to learn how to fight and to defend themselves and now we're doing a little bit of acting Mm. but i put scenarios into the training we try and um, elicit emotions in training Instead of mm-hmm. eliminate them in training, and this is a martial art, stand, relax. I'm mm-hmm. like, no, let's wake up. Let's get you stressed. Let's get you anxious. Let's get you panicking a bit. And so I want you to deal with those emotions. So for mm-hmm. me, instead of creating a system that allows people to consciously recognize the emotions and understand where they are, I just try and have them feel those emotions and solve them. Mm-hmm. And and that has worked for me quite well with my students with dealing with their anxiety with their stress mm. um, and, and yeah because yeah. like what you're talking is essentially it's called exposure therapy and i i exposure think, therapy. yeah krama guy is exactly that if you're anxious and you stick around krama guy you're not going to be as anxious and you know i see it i know if a student's got it in their tests because you know when I have I have like a technical portion in every test and then I have like the stress test where I'm like they're exhausted 10 20 minutes straight and you'll see if they know because when they stop thinking and they're they're finally at that point where they're so tired they stop thinking all of a sudden their technique is better and it doesn't make sense yeah. that that should be how it's counterintuitive but I've seen it over and over and over when they get out of their heads all of a sudden they start doing the techniques that they're drilling because they're so tired and their body just doesn't. All of a sudden, they save themselves. Whereas if they're in their head, they're failing. It's it's yeah. interesting, you know. I don't know if you've seen yeah, that as well. I I see it a lot. I see it by the way, not just in Krav Maga, in sports, in play, mm. in everything. It's like not necessarily flow state, but mm. it's always like that. The minute you're not thinking about it, it falls more naturally. And I think there is some scientific backing to it, you know, neuroplasticity, mm. active, whatever. Mm. Um, but but I agree. So if someone is standing there trying to like, okay, what do I do if some knife comes? They mistake this, to this, to this, to this. Mm. But the minute they kind of like react, which is what Karma Guy is about, reaction, mm. a lot of times they do the right thing. And even if they don't do the right thing, they do a good thing, mm. right? Yeah. And which which is what we aim to do, just to get them to do something yeah. in the end. Yeah, so it makes that's sense. A big part. Now you mentioned earlier like the spirituality, like as you move to Australia. What yeah. what does that mean to you, like uh as we grow up and find ourselves or what what do you what what's been your experience? Well, definitely I've been through quite a journey here. Mm. Uh, from leaving that uh, organization that I was in before, which was a very 
uh, it wasn't a simple break part. It was a very, very, it was a fight between mm. me and the, the other person. And it forced me to view myself and my life and my values. And through the years here, I've been connecting more to, it's, it's funny to say us as men, but understanding my emotions. Mm. Like in the army and everything, there's no room for emotions. Emotions are counter counterproductive. And in the culture, in the Israeli culture as well, and uh, and in in the family I grew up with as well, like emotions are were never such a big thing. With not something you talk about. And here in the past five six years, suddenly I've started this process of recognizing my emotions, understanding what they are, and then also bringing it into the into the training. Mm. Okay, what do, what do you feel now? Why do you feel that? How do we use that? You will feel this thing. The minute we're able to understand and recognize, how do we how do we work with it? Mm. Um, it's it's quite a journey, and I also feel that it has not just made me a better teacher. It changed how I teach, right? Instead of okay, this person in front of you touched you, boom, smash him, da, da. Okay, let's try to understand. They're also a bit stressed. Okay, what led to this? What's the, the the emotional thing that's happening to them and to you, and how we can use it for our advantage? How can we de-escalate verbally? Mm. Um, it's been it's been a journey but yeah, yeah for me australia has been a huge platform to grow as a person mm. emotionally and that's what i call spirit right mm. i call connecting to our emotion and um, i won't call it necessarily to our soft side but to mm. all of our sides but, yeah um, yeah i mean i agree like the woke stuff for lack of a better i i despise because i think it's, it's i don't like that word yeah, yeah it's, it's i don't know what else to call it but it's it's well-meaning poorly executed that is causing a lot of trouble um so like for me for example like i grew up you know my father is british they don't do emotions at all they don't talk about nothing um, exactly and I didn't grow up in a very emotional home. And, and there's a, a history of uh, depression in our family and, you know, other factors that led to me. I didn't know how to express myself without, you know, freaking out in anger. Um, and uh, when I first started my school, uh, there was a lot of issues, business partners, other stuff. But the fact that I was an, an, unable to express myself without losing it did a lot of damage for sure. Now, now, if I tell someone to fuck off, it's like totally intentional. Like, I don't need you in my life. Here's why. Go away. But back then it would be, you know, quite explosive. And for me, uh, it's taken a long. Actually, my wife and uh, we've we COVID forced us. We got married because of COVID. We basically we both have issues and we were stuck together. Basically, <laughs> we were and we just decided, you know, we, we got to make this work or else. I don't know. Now, I. Uh, I've been fairly open on my podcast. You don't have to say anything on your end, but I, for me, I am disgustingly disappointed in Western medicine when it comes mm -hmm. to solving a lot of these issues. And a lot of the ideas coming from the woke people, as I said, I think are misguided and silly. And a, a long time ago, I uh, uh, listened to research from Johns Hopkins University, the MAPS guys, if you know them. And uh, I, yeah. started ex I started exploring the psychedelics and I started took a particular type and I've been taking it allegedly for many years. It's going to get legalized here anyway. Um, Hopefully. And it started, yeah, yeah, and it, it started helping me dramatically. And then let's just say another one was introduced to me in the last few years. Uh, amazing success with PTSD people. And so I started experimenting with another one. And I can say, allegedly from personal experience, that I took this thing and it was like boom and all of a sudden i'm able to actually articulate without getting as worked up and uh, a lot of these things whether it be you know trauma induced or experiential or learned behaviors right uh, this has helped me right i understand in theory i took psychology i understand in theory what you need to do and the behaviors you need to do but for some people like myself who have treatment resistant issues that the doctors here could give two shits about no matter what they say. Um, uh, and I mean, Western medicine is great for, you know, broken bones or if you have a heart attack yeah, or the yeah, standard yeah. stuff, it's amazing, but they're very clearly failing, failing dramatically. And even though they're with mental health and they're failing with 
other areas of preventative medicine and making people better and happier. And I, I don't know what you do, but I see you at those uh, the rave things there. Um, <laughs> And it, it uh, you're seeing, I think, and and if if we want to call that spirituality, it uh, is spirituality. It's, it is uh, spirituality. I think a lot more people are becoming open to this stuff now. Yeah, I can I can see a wave of people. First, I'm a big fan of uh, psychedelics. I'm a big yeah. fan of of doing internal work, yeah. and I think psychedelics are a catalyst for doing it. And like you said, they I think where they help the most is where there is persistent persistent issues that we find it hard to break through mm. and and that's what they do i think they have a huge part in human society and should play a bigger part but due to some weird legislation and like politics corruption you know, it's it's corruption them. plain and simple <laughs> uh, yeah yeah i don't yeah. understand why panadol is legal right why you have like this medicine and we have medicine that people are, get addicted to and mm. die from and something like a mushroom that grows in the trees in the forest uh, is illegal but i'm a big fan of it especially now with research around it and and getting it and um, i i i wish we didn't need these things to connect better to ourselves mm. but i think we're doing how we are right if i look at tribes of human society in the past you had a spiritual leader that anyone in the tribe would have access to a shaman or something so we would actually constantly be checked and measured and faced with spirituality with our emotions and now we don't have it so much mm. so having having this outside tool a psychedelic um, uh, something that forces us into like this process that really faces us with everything in a short short and heightened uh, time uh, i think there's a need for it and it works mm. i also think that part of how I integrate spirituality into my training since I become a bit more woke, more mm. aware is my ability to connect with my students. Mm. And that is a huge view, one. Yeah, yeah. That's a huge one. And what I view my role is instead of just an educator, instead mm. of just a, a teacher, you come, this is the skill here, take it. When people come, I understand that they come because it's much more. They come to deal with their anxiety. They come to have a safe space. They come for many, many reasons. And I now accept it and I understand the responsibility with it. And I try to be more servicing of that. Mm -hmm. So I try to connect with my students more instead of come to the mat. Okay, Kida, let's go. Instead, it's how are you feeling what's going on how's your life what's happening i notice in training your mind isn't here what's going on tell me mm. you can talk to me it's it's part of what we we i feel we should do as um, as coaches as teachers of self-defense mm. and defend you know teach them self-defense for for it it's a healing it's a healing practice strengthening mm. the, the the body strengthens the mind mm. and we have uh, I feel somewhat responsibility to also offer that that connection, the human connection. Uh, yeah, you know, it's, it's extra. It, yeah, it's, I mean, that's one of the things I took. Uh, someone noticed, said noticeably after even the first time was my facial expression changed when I'm talking to people, and it was like something I've been told like your face, your face. I don't like the way your face looks when you're talking, and people would always get upset, Hello. and all of a sudden. You know, I took this thing and someone's saying, oh, your face is softer. And I'm like, what, what the hell does that mean? Like, it's, it's not something I can control. It's like subconscious the way my body moves. And, and, and since then, I've been able to connect with students better, as you said. And, you know, when I, when I first started teaching, I was younger. Uh, I was like, uh, I don't know, 24, I guess. And I, for whatever reason, got it in my head. Like, I don't want to be like a cult, like martial art leader. And, and, you know, I had a business partner at the time who's, fighting skill was quite good mine was mediocre and my skill is still not the best but i and i say my my, my mastery is in instruction not in practice i can do it but it's not where my real skills because i've been developing my instructional skills a lot more than my practical skills mm -hmm. uh and i'm okay with that that's fine uh um but the idea of being a mentor to people didn't really come across my my plate and now I'm realizing 
I need to do that because they're not getting it from other places a lot of the time. I mean, kids, teenagers, like I, I do 13 plus, so teenagers, adults in their 20s, even 30, 40 year olds, right? I'm just like helping them with their human experience if I can, if they want to. A lot of them don't want to, but the ones who are, who are willing to, I'll, I'll gladly help them if I can. And I, I never thought I would be doing that as a role as an instructor but that's that's something i think the kramaga world at least on the surface was lacking that like this is kramaga no spirituality this and that none of this other stuff we're just here to kill each other i just don't think you can do that if you're running a serious long-term civilian school i think you have to start accepting that role whether you like it or not as, as mentor to a degree uh, yeah. yeah i i maybe don't see myself as mentor maybe yeah. because you know, uh, it's hard for you to, to see that, but I do see myself as their friend. Anyone mm. that I see regularly on a regular basis, how can you not befriend them? You know, mm. I, and I used to be able to block myself. He's a student. He's a student. He trained with me for a year. He's a student. No, like this is a person you see regularly once a week, twice a week, checking on them, etc. They're my friends. Every person that trains with me is my friend. And, and I care about my friends. And you should care naturally. And the minute you see it and, and kind of like embrace that, the whole interaction with them changes. It's no longer, hey, how are you? It's, hey, how are you? What's going on? I, I mm. care. You're my friend. Tell me. Um, and I don't know if it's a byproduct of who I am now or the culture is, but I do think that my gym, the people who train me is full of awesome people who I like as my friends, you know? Mm. Yeah. It's, uh, it's quite a change. Which it yeah. wasn't. It wasn't always like that. It wasn't always like that. Yeah. Now, it's, it, now, now it is. Yeah. No, it totally makes sense. If you can't build a community, it's it's harder. Now, for me, I, I do have to be careful. Like, just because of my personality, it's it's totally me that I I uh, have to pick and choose which. Like, I'm friendly with everyone I talk to everyone in class, but I do have to pick and choose which students I'm willing to have a more a deeper connection with deeper. because. Uh, if you if you pick wrong, you lose a student uh, and a friend potentially. Versus if you just cautious, like for example, you know, a, a drinking culture is is a thing in Australia and here. And yeah. I used to when I was younger, like, hey, let's go drinking with all the students. And I stopped doing that as a general thing because you get the odd student that you didn't think, and they just can't handle their alcohol, and it goes very poorly. And then I started saying, yeah. okay. Uh, if someone else wants to host stuff, I'll show up. I am not responsible. I am just a person. And now, well, I mean, COVID's made it hard because we used to say uh, UFC nights, but now it's more like I only want to drink with the students I know aren't going to lose their shit. <laughs> so it's a very it's, fine line for sure. Yeah. But so two things. First, by the way, I feel that like it or not, you're you're there. You're responsible. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, well, that's it, true, yeah. <laughs> it's something that I tell my students as well, right? The minute you do Krav Maga yeah. and your close circle knows that you do Krav Maga, something happens, they're going to look at you. Yeah. The first thing like the people around me do when something happens is not deal with the situation, is look at me. Mm. And uh, whether it's students, and as their instructor, if you're in there and something happening, it will always they look at you whether you like it or not. And second, that's why, by the way, I also like you stopped with the drinking. Mm -hmm. Now what we do as social is more like food. Yeah. Then nothing bad can happen. And if yeah, someone yeah. doesn't feel like, you know, the social environment is off, you just focus on your chips and eat it. Yeah. So there's like a safe escape. And also I love food. So. Yeah. Who doesn't? I think <laughs> yeah. food is universal in every culture. Yeah. Everyone loves food. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, well, I think I think we talked about a fair amount, and uh, you probably have to get going soon. Is there uh, okay, any final things that you wanted to get say that you didn't get to say before we, we finish up? Um, no, I think we covered a lot of interesting subjects. I don't think we had a clear hmm. line, but we touched so many subjects. Yeah. From that's me. <laughs> that's great. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm just happy that I get to talk to you. I love the mm. fact that you and I are so different in such different places in the mm. world, but we are so similar. We, yeah. And what connects us is is violence. Yeah. Right? <laughs> we know that violence can connect people. Yeah. The fact that uh, we both teach Krav Maga, train Krav Maga, and found passion around, around it. Yeah. And I think that's amazing. 
It's amazing. Yeah. I have, I know so many people now around the world that I would have never believed that what connected us was the fact that we punched each other <laughs> or the fact that we, we like punching people Yeah. Uh, uh. in a safe space. Yeah, yeah, that makes total sense. Uh, how can people find you online to train with you or well, follow I have, you? I have, a, I have an Instagram called Sa'ar Krav Maga, S-A-A-R Krav Maga. I'm very responsive there. Mm. Uh, you'll probably see a lot of shirtless pictures of me. But, uh, <laughs> that's my life. And yeah. we have a business called X Fighting Krav Maga. But uh, probably reach out to me. I love talking to people. I'm not mm. like, send me an email. No, reach out to my Instagram. Talk to me. Let's go. Yeah, and you're you're in Sydney, particularly Bondi Beach, and I'm in Bondi, yeah, Bondi, in Bondi, Beach, Bondi yeah. area in Sydney, definitely. Yeah. that's where I have yeah. built my business and life right. at the moment. Yeah. Okay, well, well, thanks for coming on and taking the time of your your morning to pleasure. come on. And uh, my I, uh, pleasure. One day I'll get to Australia and visit all the guys that I talk to there. So I'll, I'd love to. I'd love to visit Canada. Yeah, you know, I love maple syrup. I love maple <laughs> butter. I love it. Yeah, for sure. Okay, well, yeah. thank you. And uh, you Cheers, have a good Jonathan. day. Yeah. You too. You too, brother. You're listening to The Warrior's Day. The Warrior's Day. Brought to you by Urban Tactics Krav Maga. Turning lambs into lions. <laughs>